This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the world, to the thought and to debate, brought to you by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern. And I'm Dalia Shenlin, and every week we'll be discussing books and ideas and literature uh, about Israel and other places uh, relevant to Israel that have caught our attention. Our guest today is Sarah Kramer. I've known her for a long time. She is currently the Director of External Relations and Resource Development of Beit Bar College in Israel. Sarah is a social entrepreneur with deep experience in the field of Arab-Jewish relations. Uh, she's also a previous Associate Director of Ir Amim, the founder and co-director of the Center for Jewish-Arab Economic Development. She recently authored the book Vision and Division in Israel, My Journey Along the Seam, published in English by Blue Thread Books. Sarah Kramer, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. I want to ask you, you know, reading through your book, I get the sense of a lifetime of activism. I looked at the photos and I recognize many other activists that we all know. And I'm wondering, I think it spans four decades, roughly, of peace activism. Yet the situation has not reached peace. Do you ever lose hope? If not, why not? <laughs> um, I sometimes lose hope, but uh, but and then it uh, it comes back. I I believe I, I would characterize myself more as a an activist for um, for equality and social justice uh, more than you know peace. I think it's a it's a more specific aim, and it's something that we actually can influence uh, much more within this country. Because I'm speaking as an Israeli, I've been living in Israel since 1980, and. Um, I always look at the at Europe and say that if in World War II, you know, 80 million people were, were were murdered, killed, and displaced, and then the European Union could rise out of that, even if it's having the problems now that it's having, we can solve our problems here in Israel. It's our duty, and I think it's the, the future to work together to create a situation where recognizing that 21% of our population is Arab and, you know, 79% is Jewish, and in each of those populations there are huge differences, we are creating a society that includes everybody and where it's a joint venture. I mean, I think this is, this is where I come out at the end of the book, and it's where I, I, I continue in my work every day, that we are our society is a joint venture between all of the different tribes. Ruby Rivlin, our president, uh, describes uh, Israeli society as being made up of four tribes, uh, the secular Jews you know, in Tel Aviv and the, the uh, Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, the Arabs, uh, and the, the religious national who are in many cases uh, settlers on the West Bank, and that our challenge as an Israeli society today is to create a, a joint venture, he doesn't mm-hmm. use those mm-hmm. terms, mm-hmm. Of of all those groups, and I, and and that's what we're doing. Okay, it's clearly not working, and I'm sorry to, <laughs> to say that, that so bluntly. W- what are you doing wrong? What am I doing? Wrong? No, you, you, people <laughs> Blame like it on you. Her. Blame <laughs> it on her. Um, well, I would challenge the um, the notion that it's not working, because if you look at um, daily life, I mean, the the place where I work now, Bade Barrel College is made up of approximately a quarter, you know, Arabs and three-quarter Jews in the student population. And our faculty is about 15% Arab, you know, and uh, and uh, majority Jewish. And so not that's too, or off, too far off from the population statistics. Not too far off from the population. That's a huge, huge difference from when I came to this country in 1980 and I lived in the, the Arab town of Tamra in the Galilee, and there was one woman in the entire town of, it was then, I think, 18,000 people, one woman who had gone away to study in college in the entire town. That's a huge difference. Now, something like 13% of the undergraduates in Israel all over the country are Arabs. And I will point out that a higher percentage of the Arab higher education students are women, which indicates something about that. Let me ask you to back up just for a minute. I mean, I think I'd like for our listeners to know Give us a few examples of the kinds of things you've done over those four decades that express this act, the activism for equality that you believe in. Well, you know, I started off in uh, in Tamra in 1980, where um, there were we were in interns for peace, uh, and uh, we were American Jews working with uh, Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs um, on a team doing cross cultural community work, and. Um, 
you know, when I came into the village, uh, people said, oh, oh, th- these are the CIA agents, you know. I mean, and, and you know, they, they were suspicious of, of everybody and for good reason because I think the, the Shin Bet, the, the uh, uh, Israeli uh, internal security, internal security um, it constantly is involved in the lives of uh, Arab citizens of Israel and more so then. But still today. And still today, yes. And um, and so people were very suspicious. Uh, and our work at the time was uh, was not to allay suspicions against us, or uh, but but to create contacts and connections that were normal. I mean, we taught, uh, we paired six pairs of schools, elementary schools for the most part, between Kiryat Atta, which was the neighboring town of Tamra, and Tamra, and uh, Tamra was entirely Muslim. Uh, Kiryat Atta, entirely Jewish, uh, and um, and relatively, um, Kiryat Atta, not a rich town, uh, very working class. And during that time that we um, we paired those communities, that was in 1981, 82. In 1982, the, the war in Lebanon broke out, the first war in Lebanon. And uh, immediately, you know, you would walk down the streets in Kiryat Atta, half of the population, the men, were like gone from the streets. I mean, you would, it was just physically, and coming from the United States, I had, it was a totally new experience to me to, to walk down the streets and there were no young men. And then you'd go back to Tamra. I would go back to time our group would and and uh, life was uh, as if normal I mean it looked normal people behaved more or less normally but they were watching TV uh, in Lebanon and their relatives their grandparents were, were refugees from 1948 who were living in refugee camps in uh, Sidon and Tyre so I mean that was how I sort of started off my my career in uh, Jewish Arab relations and activism. And during that period, we were able to create, um, there was one out of the six pairs of schools that decided that it was, that they wanted to stay together during the period of the war and they wanted to continue meeting and that this was their educational duty. But only one out of the six pairs. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, okay. that's true. Okay. <laughs> well, I'd like to ask you now about coming here. When you came here in 1980 as a young woman from the United States, did you come with that in mind? Did you realize full well uh, that Israel is a country riddled with divisions and social problems? Did, or did you not have an idealized vision of Israel like so many diaspora Jews have upon coming here? I think I came uh, with not not the understanding of the depth of the division and not the understanding of the you know, the deep, deep, deep roots, but I came because of the problems. I mean, it was, um, it, I was not a kind of a typical Zionist, um, and my parents were not, you know, were, were, were almost disappointed in many ways when I came here um, because they felt that I should stay and work for, you know, what I believe in, in America, where Which I Which would have up. been what? Oh, I mean, also uh, social equality. justice okay. and equality. It's not something new, but... It's- so let me ask you this. What about the other divisions in Israeli society? Why did you decide to focus specifically on Arab Jewish and not, you know, socioeconomic gaps in general, per people living in the more remote areas of Israeli society, Ashkenazi Mizrahi divides, Ethiopians, there's so, any number of divisions to choose from? It's a good question. Um, I think think that it has a lot to do with just where I fell at the beginning, uh, which was in a program called Interns for Peace that was looking at the Jewish-Arab uh, connection. And, uh, and it became very compelling, uh, partly because I guess as I grew, I grew up in the United States as a minority group myself. You know, and I felt very much uh, a minority and, you know, my parents and grandparents uh, experienced discrimination because of being Jewish in America. And I somehow felt that this was some kind of a, a tikkun in a way that if, if we're in a state that's, uh, you know, that defines itself as a Jewish and democratic state, um, let's be the best, uh, the best that we can be in terms of majority, major- minority relations. If if I understand your analysis correctly, and I may, I may well not understand it correctly, um, grassroots level is seem, seems to be doing pretty well, as you said in the opening of of the conversation. Now, I mean, relatively well, and the the political um, realm or sphere is often the one um, getting in the way. Did you ever try to take your efforts further up? 
to uh, decision-making circles and try and influence there? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, first of all, I don't want to paint a rosy picture. I mean, I, I don't, you know, we're not living in, uh, uh, we're not living in, an, in any kind of an ideal society. We're living very much in a real society. And, and part of that reality is that on the social level, um, over half of the Arab children in Israel are, um, are living under the poverty line. Now, that, I mean, that's that's part of the reality, and that's, you know, only about a quarter of the Jewish or a fifth of the Jewish children are living under the poverty line. Mm. So, um, but yes, I mean, in many of the in many of the places that I worked in the, uh, certainly in the Aramim, uh, which was dealing with issues of the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict in Jerusalem, uh, we were very much concerned with policymaking and, um, and uh, were uh, looking to change the situation, for example, of uh, uh, investments in education in Jerusalem. Uh, which which actually we succeeded to a certain extent in getting a lot more schools built in East Jerusalem and things like that. And that was certainly a policy issue. Um, but on many policy issues, you know, we did not succeed. It's not like I can say, ah, oh, well, you know, it's all, it's a, it's a, uh, a, a, a straight line mm. success story. Not at all. But let me ask you this. I mean, you've spent your all of your, your lifetime of activism in civil society from one organization to another. And we still see that in many ways the problems are still bad. Let's say they're not worse, mm-hmm. but maybe they're still bad or different. Have you never thought, you know, maybe the civil society activism model isn't effective enough and I myself want to go into some other realm, like maybe politics or business? I mean, I know you also are a co-founder of the or a founder and a co-director of the Center for Jewish Arab Economic Development. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe there's other realms, the private sector or uh, or politics where you could be influential. I mean, the private sector, I think that's very much that uh, was at the basis of the work that I did with the Center for Jewish Arab Economic Development, which was spanned, uh, you know, 15 years I worked there. And I mean, I founded it. And and, and the, the whole premise of the work is that the private sector is uh, is a powerful force for change. And I think we see that now. Um, uh, we see that now in, in, in the high tech industries where, you know, we put a lot of enf- emphasis and I'm now on the board of an organization called Sofin, which is dealing with uh, getting more Arab. Uh, Israelis into high tech and getting more high tech companies to locate in Arab towns. And now in Nazareth, there is, as a result of the work that we were all, we've all been doing, there is a small high tech center which employs, you know, hundreds of people and and is creating, a, you know, Amdocs has located there. Uh, other major companies are looking to locate in, in Nazareth. This would be, have been unthinkable um, 20 years ago. Uh, so sometimes the you know the 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 statements of politicians are not the only reality um, that we should be looking at, listening to, or measuring. Do you feel that your identity sometimes gets in the way, not only as an Isra- Jewish Israeli uh, woman, but also an immigrant? You know, with uh, Aliyah being such a contentious issue for um, for the Palestinians here. Tell us a bit about the dynamics of your work with uh, with with the Palestinians with the, with that community. With the pa- Palestinian, I've had much more experience with Palestinians in Israel. Palestinian no, that's what citizens, I mean. yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think the dynamics uh, on a on a very personal level. I don't think that's gotten in the way. Let's put it that way. I don't think the they fact never that said, I was. What are you doing here? I don't remember that question. And they never up. said, "How do you have a right to be here when my aunt?" you know, had to flee and was living in a refugee camp in Lebanon getting bombed, but you just walked in the door. You never felt that? I never felt that on a personal level because I think that the people who I was working with um, looked much more at what I did rather than, you know, what I symbolized. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, and uh, and that's the way that I related to them. I think one of the one of the hardest times that, uh, that, that I had in Israel was during the Second Intifada, when it really did feel like all of the work that we had done, you know, was was blowing up in our faces, literally, uh, literally. And um, you know, I knew people who were in uh, who were in Piguim, who were in uh, terror attacks, and uh, and and it was uh, it really felt like you know, what am I doing this for? And um, you know, I think in in the book, I, I also relate that you know, it was a period of of some personal depression as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and and again, I think that you know you can't ignore these periods of of deep social depression or personal depression, but it's a part of a larger story. And the question is, are we? Sometimes I think of it like uh, ways. You know, the uh, the the application where 
if you make a wrong turn, you know, it doesn't start screaming, you, you idiot, you know, why are you doing it? It keeps the goal in mind and says, goes, brrr, you know, and, and does its little recalibration and finds another route that can get you to the goal. Although that you're sometimes I to think reach. I hear in a uh, subtext in what the, in what ways is saying <laughs> yeah. saying you idiot. Yeah. Let me, since you brought up the second intifada, I want to ask you about that period. I mean, your book really illustrates very painfully how how horrible that time was, how all the work and the hopes you know seemed to come undone, and how the physical fear and mutual suspicion was just rampant. You know, you couldn't shake this feeling all the time. And in some ways, you know, we're not in that situation now. We're in a sort of political stagnation, but at least things aren't quite as immediately suffocatingly tense all the time. Do you think that the fact that people have this recent collective memory on both sides of how bad things were then is making both sides kind of feel like, well, the political situation isn't good now, but it's not that and we don't want to go back to that. So let's just keep sort of flowing the way we are now. Well, I don't think it's just keeping flowing. Yes, I think there is a a people kind of felt how bad it can get um, if we don't do something. After the second intifada, I see you you, you asked about policy, Gilad, and and I think policy is is critical. And in all the work that that I've done in the non-governmental organizations, a big goal was to change governmental policy. And if I look at today's policy, both in economic development and in education, there's a realization. There's now an an authority for uh, development of the, they call it the Arab Druze Shirkazan sector. They can't just say, you know, the Palestinian minority in Israel, but that's fine. There's an authority, governmental authority that is now budgeted. And and it, about a year ago, there was a governmental decision to equalize socioeconomic budgets. Now, of course, you know, the, with, the, a, great, with a great financial investment, with right? An millions, unprecedented, you know. unprecedented millions, five year, you know, and an authority to carry it out and intensive work with uh, Arab local authorities um, all over the country. And, um, and um, I think these are these are very significant things. Uh, absolutely, but at the same time as you know the government paying more attention mm-hmm. to um, non-Jewish minorities within Israel, its willingness to deal with to solve the Palestinian issue to resolve the conflict is. Um, Almost no, an inverse yeah, relationship. Exactly, yeah. exactly, an inverse correlation, if you will. Um, so my question to you is: Is it all worth it? I mean, can Jewish um, Arab relations within Israel improve and even perhaps prosper without the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian or, conflict. Or even worse than that, perhaps the government is trying to show just just leave us alone on the Palestinian issue and as a reward we will invest more in Palestinians inside Israel in a divide and conquer kind of way. I think it's um, it's two legs of you know of a walk. And um, and so we can continue to walk with a crutch, you know, on the improving the relations between Arab and Jewish citizens within the country. And that is not dependent. That is an independent variable. So maybe it's not. I, I don't know if the two-legged uh, metaphor is a good one. But that is not – we are not required to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in order to move forward on civic equality. Um, and and that I think is the, that's the bottom line that keeps me you know whether I'm in uh, doing non governmental work or now I'm in a, a in a wonderful uh, academic institution Beit Barrel College that is that is working as part of it's a public college we're funded by the government we you know uh, we train uh, educators cultural leaders artists uh, uh, public servants and and. Um, and it's done in a way that recognizes and teaches our students to grapple with these issues of inequality and to be able to discuss them in the classroom or bring them up in art and and to pr- and to propose changes. I, I think the key is not stopping. I mean, you know, it's the. But no, but going back to Dalia's question, mm-hmm. that was put a lot more bluntly than mine. Uh, <laughs> don't you think that in this way you actually play into the hands of a right wing go- an intransigent right wing government? That's even more blunt, Gilad. Yeah. Mm. Um, no. 
Uh, I'm not going to want to answer Let me ask you another but, question. Uh, I'll, no, tell you why. Why. Yeah, I'll tell you why. I mean, I'll tell you why. Because I think equality is is uh, important for any vibrant society, especially ours, which is deeply divided. You know, I mean, I didn't call my book Vision and Division in Israel by accident. They, we have deep, deep divisions. You don't, you know, get over deep divisions in a moment or apparently not in a generation or two. And because we're stuck totally uh, in terms of solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, in a more general way, th- that's no excuse for um, for desisting, as you know, Rabbi Tarfon said, you know, you're not free uh, uh, to desist. You know, you uh, it's not incumbent upon you to uh, you know to resolve the conflict, but you're not free to desist from making a more equitable society. I don't think our equi- the equitability of our society, or the, the lack of it, is 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 no. Um, it's not dependent on solving the larger problem. We can today say, you know, we're committed to equalizing relations and and it doesn't matter whether it's Jews and Arabs or or Haredim you know ultra orthodox and I mean, we have total responsibility and capability for creating a much more equitable society now. We don't have to wait. I think it's the opposite. We don't have to take excuses that, oh, we can't solve the larger conflict and it's so terrible. No, it it is terrible. But, you know, that's not an excuse for sitting around and not addressing the other issues. Maybe I can even push that thought one step further as a response and say perhaps it's the opposite in the sense that the more we advance equality among citizens inside Israel, the more it will become clear that if we now annex and bring more Palestinians to become citizens of Israel, we will have to owe them that same sort of equality. And maybe this will have ramifications in the other direction, but that's just a thought. Let me ask you another question. Um, after all those years uh, of different you know, forums of work for activism between Arabs and Jews in Israel, what would you say is the biggest challenge or problem today that holds back equality? Or what is the biggest thing that needs to be solved between or either within the Arab community or between Arabs and Jews to balance out their level of equality? Mm. Excellent question. Um, I think that addressing the socioeconomic um, differences is is really um, crucial, and the role of women actually is is a is a key to that. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning that there are more women students, Arab students, than men, and that is in higher true. education. In higher yeah. education, and and I think that the, as women's role changes and women's position in within arab society changes that that creates huge change in um it ripples throughout the system i want to ask you about you know your home it is israel after all did you ever think about going back and fighting for the same cause in the united states i think that after november 2016 it's uh, more urgent than ever Hmm. And and you can also relate this to your personal story, which is a big part of the book. I mean, that you had a terrible personal tragedy. I don't know if you want to talk mm-hmm. about it, but mm-hmm. maybe did you ever think after that that maybe, you know, what do I have to do here in Israel? I think there were times after my husband died in, uh, um, uh, many years ago um, that I, um, uh, I did think of sort of picking up and, you know, going back. But really, my life at this, I decided not to do that because I felt that what was pulling me forward was the sense of working in this society, which, you know, as a, as a Jew, I find it intensely meaningful to be living in Israel. Painful in many ways because, you know, there are many things going on in the society that, that, that pain me, whether it's on, you know, there not only Jewish-Arab relations, but also uh, the, the lack of pluralism in, in uh, you know, recognition of uh, reformed Jews, conservative Jews in, in, in this country. Um, but um, I really decided to stay here. And once I made that decision, um, you know, in the... Uh, in 1990s, um, I, you know, my children grew up here. My children are now in their 20s. Uh, and, uh, you know, one just finished the army and is uh, deciding what to do next in his life. The other is in, about to graduate from college. And um, my life is here, you know, and uh, my partner uh, is here and his family is here. And, and I think it's very personal. You know, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I am proud to be active in social change, but I'm a human being and mm. <laughs> living an individual life and a, with a family, and uh, that's a big part of it. But when you go back to when you visit the United States, how how does it feel? I mean, to be 
Does it feel like a certain homecoming or visiting a foreign land now, 40 years after, almost 40 years after moving to Israel? Tell us a bit about your your thoughts. Um, well, I, you know, my brother and his family and many of my other relatives still live in the United States. And uh, I am very pained by the social uh, tensions in, in in America as well. I mean, the, the Trump and the and the you know, the kind of xenophobia that is uh, sweeping across and the alternative, uh, uh, the alternative facts, which are basically, you know, a, a whitewashing, you whitewashing lies. I mean, a, a, you know, a sense of that lying is okay. You know, lying is part of uh, policy. And I think it's coming back into this country. There's a, there's kind of a connection, you know, between the, the political atmosphere in the United States and the polit- political atmosphere here, mm-hmm. because they're very, very, the two societies are very connected on the policy level and and uh, that's very yeah. disturbing and and it's something that we have to fight no matter you know who we are so, whatever yeah. issues we're working on you know speaking of I shouldn't say lies, but let's talk about national mythology sort of the romantic self-image that we all have of who we are I remember in one of the very early chapters in your book when you when you were in Tamar you said you were observing how these systematic inequalities work and you said I fear that Israel in the future could become a really you know deeply unequal state and I sort of wondered, were you looking back on Israel's history and saying once we were better and we need to preserve what we had in the past or the values we had in the past? And if so, isn't that a bit of a romanticization of the self-image of Israel? After all, Israel was never a particularly equal society between Arabs and Jews. What are these narratives and myths that we tell each other about who we are? And if you're seeking social change, is it really about preserving what we had or changing who Israel was, even in its past? I, I think it's an excellent point. I don't think that the, there's nothing romantic about our past in in the in terms of Jewish Arab relations. I think it's only getting better, despite the rhetoric, which may be getting worse. But I think the rhetoric getting worse is sort of a proof of uh, a, a growing equality. Because uh, if 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 things were um, not changing. The political um, echelons that want to keep things the way they were wouldn't have to be so um, virulent. And so they're sort of being reactionary against things going in the right direction. I, I believe so. And and when the president of Israel, you know, who is not a, a left wing activist, he comes from the Likud. Reuven Rivlin is an old Likud family. Um, when he says we have four tribes in this country and they are not equal. And that only half of these tribes are, if you look at the, the, the population of Israel, the, the kids in first grade, about uh, a quarter of them are ultra-Orthodox, a quarter of them are Arab Israelis, Palestinian citizens of Israel, and the other two quarters, half, are, you know, the, the national religious Jews and, and, and secular Jews. Um, that's a huge difference from the the Israel that I came to. That's the reality. And I think our, our, our challenge is to create a vibrant society as a joint venture. And I think this is really, it, it, it's, it's not that we were a better joint venture then. We were different democratic, demographically then when I first came, but there was much less equality. Let me ask you just one last question because we are quickly running out of time. Sadly. Uh, sadly. Um, we talked about the uh, uh, Second Intifada briefly and how everything fell into pieces. During that time, a lot of left-leaning Zionists, liberal Zionists, if you will, underwent um, an ideological metamorphosis, if you like. Uh, some of them joined uh, the right and gave up on the prospects of, um, of uh, you know, negotiated peace. And others uh, became more radical in the leftism, you know, just shunning Zionism or, or minimizing it uh, almost to the minimum. What about your politics? Uh, did it really remain the same even during uh, that um, that um, crucial period? Would you say that your, your, your politics is pretty much uh, consistent uh, over your four decades of activism? I'd have to say that it's fairly consistent, which maybe makes me, you know, the consistency is the bugaboo of, uh, of small minds or whatever they say. But um, 
I I think it's based on you know the same vision that I uh, that I started out with, and that uh, and and looking forward to where where we want to go. We want to create a society where there is greater opportunity, equality of opportunity for all of the citizens of this society, and to move forward with that. And I believe that as we become a more equal society, hopefully. Um, then we'll be able to deal with the larger conflict uh, from a much stronger and different position that will maybe come up with some very bizarre and unthinkable, currently unthinkable solutions, which I also don't know what they are. Mm. Halavai is yeah. all we can say. Inshallah. Sarah Kramer, you are the Director of External Relations and Resource Development of Beit Barrel College. Your book is called uh, Vision and Division in Israel, My Journey Along the Seam. It's published in English by Blue Thread Books, and it can be ordered on the Facebook page. On our Facebook page, which is called, uh, all one word, Vision and Division in Israel, uh, on Facebook, and uh, also the same thing in Gmail, uh, and uh, we can get the book to you, and we'd be very pleased to. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on the show. And also big thanks to Tammy Goldenberg, our sound engineer, and to the Van Leer Institute for their generous support. If you like this podcast, there are many more where it came from. Just go to www.tv1.fm slash podcasts and take your pick. Don't forget to visit our new website, telavivreview.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. <laughs>